Dragon Ball Z Online was a game that was originally released in Korea in 2010, followed by a Taiwan and Hong Kong release in 2011. Unfortunately, however, on the 26th of September in the year 2013, the Korean version was shut down, with the Taiwan and Hong Kong versions following shortly after. However, Dragon Ball Z Online is not dead. In 2015, a group of ambitious people got together to start Dragon Ball Online Global, a private server project created for the purpose of reviving an old but not forgotten and very well cherished game. And in 2018, we saw the private server release as an open beta. I was not and have never been aware of a Dragon Ball Z MMO. DBZ was a massive part of my childhood, and because of the recent passing of its creator, Akira Toriyama, may he rest in peace, but because of this unfortunate news, I was looking into re-watching some Dragon Ball Z when I stumbled upon this game and this private server. So let's jump into it. Let's see how this Dragon Ball Z MMO plays in the year 2024. I'm going to be completely honest here, a franchise-themed MMO from the early 2010s doesn't necessarily inspire confidence in me personally. However, stick to the end of this video. Dragon Ball Z Online might just surprise you. But really quick, before we get into all of that, this video is sponsored by none other than World of Tanks. World of Tanks is a free-to-play online combat vehicle game that's accessible to anyone. Whether you're a novice or a pro, jump in and experience the same thrill as over 100 million players have before. You can download the game by using the first link in my description. World of Tanks has some seriously massive battles across open hills, steep fields, forests, deserts, you name it. With over 40 different battle arenas, you can rally your teammates and devise a battle plan. Featuring tank destroyers, artillery, light, medium, and heavy tanks, how you play is up to you, and there is over 800 tanks to try. One thing I should mention which really stood out to me is World of Tanks actually features authentic models which are historically accurate and inspired in order to make you feel like a real tank commander taking part in a furious battle. Once again, using the first link in the description, you can download World of Tanks today. And if you're a new player, make sure to use the code COMBAT to get 7 days of premium, 250,000 credits, and the premium tank Cromwell B. If you're a returning player, you can get 3 days of premium, the 2D style bargain camouflage, and a 7 day rental of the premium tank Centurion MK51. Thanks again to World of Tanks for sponsoring today's video, now let's get back to some DBO. Alright, we're in. 8 character slots and 1 global server. The character select screen actually looked pretty nice with this temple in the background. Graphically, it doesn't look too bad at all, considering. Now, moving into character creation in DBO, you start out as a child, and as you progress through the game, you can actually grow older. There are three different races to choose from, Human, Namekian, and Majin. Each of those races has two different classes to choose from, from things like Martial Artist, to Warrior, to Dragon Clan, and Mighty Majin. Later on in the game, you'll find there's more class identity to choose from and niche down with, but at the start, these are your six options. I ended up choosing the human martial artist as I felt that was most in line with my childhood hero, Goku. Customization has a few different hair and color options, but it's kind of lacking. You can't really make yourself stand out too much, however, some of the different hair options are pretty amazing. The game starts you off with a lovely cutscene explaining the history of the Dragon Balls before plopping you in a tutorial that takes place at the Kame House. The interface actually looks surprisingly clean. Your character and all of its requisite info is in the top left, there's a mini-map in the top right, and your action bars and menus are all located in the bottom right of the screen. The game shows you to your skill menu where you can apply skill points and add skills to your action bar, and I was also shown the character sheet, which of course shows you all of your equipped armor, weapons, stats, etc. Afterwards, I was told to fight this large ladybug, which looked like something out of Toontown. But the combat was pretty standard. Right click to auto attack and your abilities when used will begin a cooldown and they require energy points or EP, which is basically stamina. In my inventory I had a gift box which stays with you through the leveling process and it will give you useful items at certain level thresholds. I also had this training G, which I didn't know at the time but this is an appearance item and appearance items are the only items that will actually change how your character appears. Normally, equipping any other items won't have any actual effect on how you look, except for certain weapons later on. However, I was okay with this training G. With its edgy flames, it looked like something that Guy Fieri would wear to a dojo. I progressed through the tutorial a bit longer and even met up with Trunks, who taught me how I could go about finishing the tutorial and making it to the main game. These little green bubbles over an NPC's head will indicate that they have a quest for you. Apparently, I had to catch some Kawangas. Okay. So, because every character is wearing a scanner, whenever you target an enemy, you get to see their power level. It's over 9,000! As well as other info like HP and distance. 
After completing the quest, I got myself to level 2 and I was teleported to the real main game and I was placed in the human starting zone at Kokura Village. While there, I looked in my inventory and found something called a fly scroll, which would grant me the flight ability for a short period of time. I was blown away by this. Flying in a DBZ MMO just seems so cool to me. I know that it's technically the same thing as a flying mount in most other MMOs, but something about your character just jumping up and flying away seriously intrigued me. I remember the early Dragon Ball Z games on PlayStation 2, you couldn't actually fly around, and when they finally came out with that addition, it was an actual game changer. Afterwards, I set my home to Kokura Village at the Popo Stone, which basically acts like a hearthstone or a home teleport that you can use once every hour to come back. Now, I was actually quite surprised to see a decent amount of other players milling around in this area. Evanoski over here looked to be a grown-up character, and he was level 70, which is the max level in Dragon Ball Online. At this point, I had no idea how I was supposed to age my character, whether that was just by leveling or participating in some sort of story questline, but something that's really unique to DBO is having age separate different characters. You can tell that Evanoski here is much higher level. He's literally taller. He seems to be in some sort of Super Saiyan state, and honestly, not many games have me looking at other max level characters with awe or wonder. But because of the stark differences between my fresh level 2 character and this guy's character, it was kind of a cool experience. Speaking of the population, however, I have to mention the DBO startup screen. Not only do they tell you how many players are currently online, they actually have a heat map of the entire game, showing where those players are actually located in the game. It's reminiscent of the Call of Duty Black Ops heat map from back in the day. It's also super cool to see real-time data of current players, as so many companies are usually trying to obfuscate and hide these details, but obviously for a private server like this, there's really no concern. It appears that there's actually about 14,000 average monthly players, which honestly is pretty impressive. Anyway, I made my way out into the world and I started questing. You have a quest tracker on the side that's super helpful, and also looking at the minimap will give you markers and hints on where you need to go for your quests. I was already beginning to notice that inventory space was becoming a bit of a problem. All I had currently were these 16 slots, and I had noticed earlier while looking in the shop that more bags would cost like 4,000 zen, which is the currency used here. I currently only had 215 zen, so hopefully by doing some questing I'd be able to acquire some more money. I got myself to level 3 and saw a few other players hanging out. This guy here seemed to be charging up some kind of ability, maybe he was trying to go Super Saiyan, I don't know. Afterwards, I ended up finding the bank. That should help a little bit with inventory space, because here you can obviously store items that you can grab at a later time. While I was there, I realized I had a flying squirrel mount thing in my inventory, so I used it. It looked a little silly and it didn't seem to make me go any faster, but if you take a look at this pop-up menu down here, you'll actually see that there's an empty slot. That's where you can actually put fuel, and depending on the quality of fuel, it will dictate how much your movement speed is increased. Obviously, I didn't know that at the time, and I thought this mount just sucked, so I promptly put it away. And I continued questing throughout this area. Questing is pretty standard, with lots of fetch quests, talk to this NPC, kill 10 of these, you know, the typical MMO questing experience. However, then I ran into my first time rift. Essentially, there are rifts located throughout the world in which you will time travel and play out a scenario often featuring lots of popular characters from the show. These are super fun, and usually you'll learn an ability from these time rift scenarios that are super beneficial and essential to your progression. In this particular one, I worked with Gohan, who was a grandpa at this point in time, and we found a crashed spaceship not far from his house. At the end, he teaches you how to charge up an RP ball, or charge RP in general, and that's what I saw that character doing at the bottom of the stairs just a few moments prior. At this point in time, I took a quick trip to Amsterdam in order to make this lovely video, and when I returned to the game about a week later, I was completely and utterly confused and basically forgot everything. But I was level 5 and ready to continue questing and experiencing DBO. The first thing I noticed is that inventory space was still a massive problem for me. I knew that each town had an auction house, so I decided to take a look on there and see if any other players were selling bags for cheap. All I found were these fairly exquisite handbags, which I think is actually an event item that definitely does not increase inventory space, but it didn't matter anyway as they were apparently worth millions. But it's okay because everything ended up working out. After completing a short quest a while later, I was finally given another 12 slot bag, which nearly doubled my inventory space. Perfect. 
Now, while you're in some of these starting zones, you'll notice if you take a look at the map that there's a sort of snaking, moving line. Those indicate buses that are traveling between areas on the map. I decided to try it out and hop onto one of these buses, but they're pretty slow. In fact, I think it's almost the exact same speed as just walking, so I'm not really entirely sure what the point of these buses is. I guess if you just wanted to travel somewhere while well, AFK, but even so, it's really not that far of a distance that it actually takes you. I got myself to level 6 and I received a quest that taught me about my personal store. Essentially, at any point in the game, you can open up shop. Your character literally turns into a storefront at which you can set items at any price and go AFK. And other players can actually come up to your storefront and purchase things from you. I was a little confused as to why this existed when clearly there's an active auction house, but still, this is interesting. I also learned about teleporters, which are located in most major hubs throughout the map, and once a teleporter has been unlocked, you can teleport there from other teleporters. I helped this girl in a bikini with some quests as I quickly remembered some of DBZ's humor, and I pondered if it was actually appropriate for me to watch the show when I was 5 years old. Anyways, I continued leveling, I got myself to level 9, and even unlocked a new ability, which increased my movement speed for a short period of time, which was an actual blessing. Now, when you're playing DBO, you will constantly be getting a currency known as tokens. From fighting monsters, completing quests, doing basically anything can reward them. And they can be used in the token shop to buy consumables, cosmetics, and a few other items. I found this mask in the token shop for the very cheap price of one single token, so I figured why not. Afterwards, while looking at the world map, I was prompted to quest in areas that were still greyed out. Even after traveling to those areas, they seem to remain greyed out. So I was a little uncertain at the time of how to actually unlock that part of the map. Doesn't matter though, because I came across another time rift scenario where I got to meet Kid Goku, flying on his Nimbus. He even stole my girl, but I wasn't too angry, I mean, it's Goku. I got myself to level 10 and I was feeling very accomplished, however, I was beginning to notice a bit of an inconvenient bug that was starting to happen. Audio. You see, every once in a while, all of my sound effects would disappear. I would still be able to hear the in-game music, but everything else would cut out. Sometimes you can remedy this by restarting the game or just logging in and out. I was able to fix it that way a few times, but unfortunately throughout the video you might notice sections of my game missing sound effects. Because sometimes even after a full restart and a server change, the game wouldn't restore the sound effects at all. It's a known issue and apparently it's being worked on is what I read in the forums. Also, another interesting thing happened, I came across a quest which actually hadn't been translated into English. In fact, this was going to be the first of many, many quests that had not been translated. Generally, however, there would be a couple of important words which had been translated. So, usually you can figure out what you need to do using context clues from the minimap and other hints. I got to level 12 and I learned Kamehameha. Awesome. And a while later, lots of fetch quests later, I got myself to level 14. This is when I found out about area revealers. These are certain locations on the map that when interacted with will actually unlock and show the previous grayed out part of your world map. It's an interesting and unique system to unlock a map that I hadn't really seen before. I ended up in another time rift where I finally got to meet Goku and the gang. It was a glorious moment of pure nostalgic pleasure as I reminisced on my childhood dreams of becoming a Super Saiyan. After completing this scenario, I got the Dash ability, which was super good for mobility and getting around the game. And then, after doing some quests for a turtle, I was told I could start the Flight questline. Now, my naive ass at the time thought that I would be able to fully unlock Flight from this questline at level 15. But that's unfortunately not quite how it works. I won't actually be able to fully unlock Flight until I'm level 30. However, these short quests will give you some scrolls that will allow you to enable Flight for a short period of time, like 3 or 5 minutes. And this quest in particular taught me about Fast Flight. You can actually go really fast and travel around the map very quick with flying. Completely avoiding all of the mobs below, this was awesome. Unfortunately, like I mentioned, I didn't actually unlock it yet, this was just a short temporary showing of it to prepare you for what's coming in the future. Anyway, lots of questing later, I made it to level 20, and actually this was when I finally found out about putting fuel into my mount so I could travel faster, even if I looked like an idiot. I got myself some nice new fighting gloves and I was directed to the next zone, Corin Forest. 
Now, I would like to mention quickly that so far leveling was a decently fast experience, but it was beginning to slow down quite a lot now that I was into the 20s. I would say the leveling experience in this game isn't quite as slow as something like World of Warcraft Classic, however, it's definitely got that older MMO leveling cadence where each level is felt and noticed. Corrin Forest seemed like what you would expect from a wooded, forested area, not too different from my original starting zone, but I was excited to look around and start questing in this new place. While here, I came across what could be described as the first real city that I had entered. It's not completely massive like some cities in some MMOs, but it's definitely the first real player hub that I came across, Corin Village. Every single one of these little shops is a player that has items for sale and is patiently AFK in hopes that someone buys something. It's so strange, I still don't understand why people don't just use the auction house or what the benefit of setting up one of these stores is. Anyway, while leveling in Corrin Forest, I came across my first ultimate dungeon, which was my first interaction with real group content. It seemed to have a party finder, but apparently you already had to be in a party for it to work. I was a little confused, but I figured there wouldn't be anyone running this level 20 dungeon anyway, so I decided to continue questing. But then, something amazing happened. These two individuals invited me to a group. They were both level 40 and it seemed like they wanted to go into the dungeon together. Neither of them were native English speakers, however, one of them understood me enough to be able to communicate with me. These two absolute pumper chads with no care in the world pulled the entire room full of mobs. Oh, and they also buffed me to like five times my HP. I didn't even realize that I had a quest to do while in this dungeon, but they showed me the way. I've been carried through content before, but this felt almost criminal. They literally told me to not even attack anything, because if I do, I'll probably die. So I did what any good noob would do, and I sat back as they did all the work. The amount of loot that was dropping from the massive packs of mobs that they were slaying, as well as the XP that I was getting, this was amazing. I finished up the quest and they took on the final boss of the dungeon, making quick and easy work of the place. Afterwards, they asked me if I had any friends in game, I said no, and they told me to add them in case I needed any help or I had any questions. Honestly, it was a really wholesome experience and the fact that I could even get a group to carry me through a dungeon in a game that by all means doesn't even exist anymore except for this private server with a few hundred players, well, I think that's pretty amazing. My first experience with the DBO community was definitely very positive. Anyways, I quested a bit more and I decided to do a bit of research and come back to DBO tomorrow, ready for another full day of questing, leveling up, and figuring out what I should be working towards. So level 24 and ready for anything. Basically, I learned that level 30 is a major turning point in the game. At level 30, you're going to unlock a quest that allows you to niche down your class. As a martial artist, I could choose to become a fighter or a swordsman. That same quest will actually age your character so that you're grown up. And on top of that, once you're a grown-up, you can finish the flying questline and actually unlock the flying skill for good. So, that's my goal, level 30. Boom, there's already 25. So many of my quests that I currently had were not translated into English that I was actually beginning to get slightly annoyed trying to figure out what to do. But that didn't stop me, a little while later, 26. A couple hours of grinding after that, level 27, and I actually unlocked a quick attack, which is like a charge, and it's a super useful ability. I then found this giant fish on the ground, which is apparently part of some in-game event. I stood no chance against this 300,000 hit points fish. However, I did find a YouTube video where some players killed it pretty quickly. Apparently, it drops a ton of currency that's used in the in-game event. I continued questing my way through Corrin Forest, and at this point, I was level 28. When I made my way back to town, there seemed to be some PvP-themed event happening in Corrin Village. There was tons of players standing around, and this absolute giant in the middle of the arena. If you step into the arena, apparently it toggles PvP, which I didn't know, but I accidentally attacked this level 70 guy beside me. Luckily, I don't think he noticed or even cared. But I can't get over how cool it is to see this community of such a small and low population game come together for an event like this. It was such a cool insight, and a little while later, some guy traded me a new set of appearance armor, which completely changed how I looked and I was extremely thankful as I was getting sick of my Guy Fieri dojo gear. I have to say, I tend to prefer games where your character is actually visibly wearing the actual items that they have equipped instead of just one single appearance item, but I was glad for the change up either way. I feel like I was beginning to look like a real DBO player. And just a few hours later, finally, I got to level 30. 
we unlock the quest to grow up, niche down our class, and afterwards achieve flying. So I began following a guide for my mastery quest, as it's called. First, I needed a specific item from the specific crate to even begin the quest. I had to then defeat 10 of these giant boars wielding butterfly nets before making my way to Corrin Tower and being teleported up top where I met, you guessed it, Corrin. He made me fight four duplicate versions of himself and upon completion, I was a grown up. I don't know how defeating four versions of Corrin made me age probably 20 years, but hey, I'll take it. Now I was definitely a real DBO player. Afterwards, I was asked if I wanted to choose the fighter class or the swordsman class. Fighters use a staff and swordsmen use a sword. I decided to go with the swordsman class as it seemed a little bit cooler. I was sent on an extremely long journey to meet with the master swordsman who is located in the zone south of me in the desert. One thing I would like to point out is that this game has no loading screens in between zones, which is actually kind of impressive considering the date of its release. The desert was the first time I truly felt like I had entered a brand new part of the game. It's actually the Majin starting zone, so it's for levels 1 to 20, but apparently this is where I needed to go to meet with the Master Swordsman. I did a couple of tasks for this Master Swordsman before fighting him and four other warriors. And finally, I was a Swordsman. And even though so far I had only unlocked one sword ability, just the visual aid of having a massive sword on my back gave me the confidence I needed to take on anything. Now that we were grown and we had finished our Mastery Quest, and I was a Swordsman, we had one last goal, my true goal of learning how to fly. I met up with Daryl here, back in Corrin Village, to begin the flying quest. He told me to visit three of his acquaintances throughout Corrin Forest, and I thought, nice, I'll just do a small quest for each of them, and bam, we'll have flying. Yeah, no, not quite. At the first individual sorrow, he told me to slay 12 enemies. And then I went back to him to hand it in, only to find out that I had to slay 8 more. So I did. And then I went back to him only to find out that I actually have to kill a boss as well. So each of these guys have three quests for me, meaning nine in total. Okay, give me a bit. And about an hour later, I finally finished all of these short little quests. And wow, flying is amazing. It gets literally my favorite part of the game. But honestly, I'm completely impressed and blown away by DBO. Such an old game surviving on such a meager player base on a private server full of dedicated fans of this game who were probably heartbroken when the original version was shut down. You might assume that these people would be closed off towards newcomers, but I felt completely welcomed as I was carried through dungeons, told to add friends, and gifted new armor. The gameplay is definitely outdated and the questing is what you would find from a lot of older MMOs, but the community is what brings this world together. As I mentioned in the beginning, I usually find franchisal games basically across the board to be gimmicky and lame, but that's absolutely not the case with DBO. They stay true to the lore, the visuals, the characters, the abilities. Everything appears to be derived correctly from the Dragon Ball universe. And if you've ever been a fan of the franchise, I highly recommend you try out this game, even just for nostalgic reasons. I had an absolute blast playing DBO, and to be honest, I would really like to continue. I might even make a video in the future of me getting to the max level and trying some more of the endgame stuff. If that's something you guys would like to see, make sure to let me know down in the comments below. But anyway folks, I want to say a massive thank you to everyone who made it to the end of the video. Don't forget a like, a comment, a subscription, those things help a bunch. And if you really enjoyed the video, think about becoming a channel member. Anyways, I will catch you all in the next one. Later.